Hello and welcome to Boil Down, the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association's podcast. My name is Greg Astley, Director of Government Affairs for Orla and your host. And today I am joined by Chef Shirley Chung, who's going to be joining us at the Northwest Food Show. Welcome, Chef. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Very excited to have you at the Northwest Food Show coming up and wanted to ask you a few questions related to that. Uh, but I want to start with kind of your journey to becoming a chef, if you could help us understand how that started and uh, where it took you. Well, I didn't know I wanted to be a chef. I like to say that I'm always passionate about food. So ever since I was little, I, I was born and raised in Beijing, China, and my grandmother worked for Red Cross uh, China. She represented China for Red Cross. So growing up, not only she's a strong woman, but she also believed in introducing the world through food to little me. So everywhere that she went, she traveled, she always bring food from like chocolate from Switzerland. She brought Coca-Cola from America. So that's like a way for her to introduce the world to me. And, and then it really sticked. So I always love food, but most importantly, I love to eat. Uh, when I first came to America uh, with my parents at age 17, my parents work in the Silicon Valley, extremely busy. And for me, I was left alone a lot. And for me, naturally, I don't know why, maybe because I lived next to a supermarket. So the way for me to learn English was going through aisles and aisles of food and reading all the labels. And then and I also watched food TV. So PBS and Food Network, uh, all that. Food Network just started in the 90s. Uh, so everything about it, food, is how I learned English. And I always love to cook and love to eat. And so I watch a lot of TV to figure out how to use a Western kitchen with the electrical stove versus real fire. And so, so I was so interested in food, so much, so in love with food, but never thinking about it as a career choice. So I went to college in uh, the Bay Area, uh, California, and then working in the Silicon Valley with my parents or actually my dad want me to work in the semiconductor sector because that's where his business at for like five six years I really didn't I'm pretty sure I did really well I made a lot of money so I used that big chunk of money to dine in every single best restaurant of the Bay Area so me and my boyfriend now husband we used to print out the list of best 100 restaurants from the Bay Area and we just go eat down the list wow. every day I know it was that's what we did in the Silicon Valley in the beginning 2000s. We made a lot of money. So uh, three things I love. I love fast cars. I love shoes and I love to eat. So that's what, and I didn't have to pay the, the pay rent because I live with my parents. Oh, so I literally spent all money on pretty much food and dining. And to the point that I love food so much that I start trying to replicate every single dish that I love from all those amazing restaurants and for my friends on the weekend. So I used to throw the best dinner parties, uh, get all my Silicon Valley friends, and then really lavish and like do it all out, it like six six hors d'oeuvres and with how many courses and, and then multiple desserts. So that's what we did, what I did for fun. And then uh, beginning of two thousand, uh, our company I was I was at a startup making firmwares and three G technology. So that just tell you how long ago was that. Uh, economy wasn't doing well, and then my company couldn't get a last round of funding to go public. Uh, so I was at a crossroad of stay in a career path that I wasn't really interested in. Well, I, I really enjoy the money, but I literally just used all the money to go on diet. Or something that I truly love, perhaps cooking, maybe is something that's calling my name. So I went to check out a school because I, I saw this commercial on TV. So I went to check out California Culinary Academy, which doesn't exist anymore. That was based in San Francisco. The first 30 minutes into my tour, I signed up for school. And then I think uh, in the back of my head, I always say like, oh, I, I'm still connecting in Silicon Valley. If I really wanted to come back to work, look for a job, and maybe I'll just go find a job easily. Um, but I never looked back. Uh, so started culinary school, and then I did externship in French Laundry, I worked for TK for three years. So throughout that, I opened Bouchon Las Vegas. So he's the reason that I spent 13 years in Las Vegas, opened multiple restaurants for a lot of celebrity chefs. So I had kind of like a little, little reputation in Vegas. So I was the opener. Every single chef was looking for me to open their concept for them. Uh, and then uh, 
Yeah, so that's how I started. It really is passion for food. So I always like to introduce myself that, yes, I'm a chef, but I truly am an eater first. I love, I just love to eat. That's phenomenal. What a great story. I, I'm, I'm not amazed, but it, it's always nice to hear the connection that people have to, you know, mothers or grandmothers who cook that, that help them to understand the connection to food and family. And so um, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, you talked about opening up concepts. Can you tell us about your newest restaurant concept, Miss Chi Cafe? So I opened Miss Chi in Culver City, so greater Los Angeles area. Uh, in We're coming up in four years now. Uh, so this is the second concept I opened under my own name, but it's the first concept that I own with my husband, who's the one that pushed me to go to culinary school. Remember that? But he was actually, he's actually an engineer. That's how we met in the Silicon Valley. But now he's my GM for four years already. Uh, so Ms. Xi, so I wanted to say Miss Xi has multiple identities because of we survived the past few years of pandemic. Mm. And we're one of this kind of, I wanted to say success stories <laughs> through a pandemic. Uh, we opened a year before pandemic happened. Um, so we had the best year when we first opened. Uh, we were so busy, especially lunchtime, because we're surrounded by studios. There's Sony Studios, uh, there is uh, Amazon Studios, and Apple Studios, supposed to all coming in. So we're in a really great lunch location. Uh, when we first opened, the lunch is out the door, uh, the line is out the door, that dinner, and also weekend, this is almost like gravy for us. Mm. Um, so we really enjoy our first year of opening the Xi and then pandemic first hit China. Uh, so we actually experienced it before everybody else because we're a Chinese American restaurant in the West side, which you don't see any Chinese restaurant nearby us. We're kind of like the token one. So during pandemic, we're all the information that's not super clear. So everybody got scared. Um, also you can see a lot less travelers. There's no more students. So our customer base all of a sudden just disappeared. And then also all the studios, they're really, they're like the first one started to stay at home. So we saw our business drop dramatically before March when the whole world kind of, or when the whole America kind of shut down. Yeah. Uh, we were be able to reopen uh, with the first round of PPP and then after that, so four months later, and then after that, we never close again. So what we've done is, uh, I have a store, I have a restaurant, uh, I, like, I like to call restaurant on Go Belly. And I started Go Belly like a couple months, literally a couple months before pandemic. And then after pandemic hit, Go Belly became this stable revenue that gave us the power to be able to renegotiate our rent because I know that we have this stable income. And at the same time that I didn't have to lay off anybody, I hire and be able to give all my staff extra time and extra overtime if they needed to. And then, so, and so we created this extra revenue. And then on top, just like everybody else, during pandemic, I'm literally just trying to see what else can stick. So I am the perfect example of I pivot. I pivot any way I can to stay alive. So one thing is bring out extra revenue onto my restaurant. So I supported my friend doing pop-up. Like I was like, great, just come into my restaurant. Let's do pop-up for you. And then we take a small percentage, but at least it's likely there's, you know, there's people. And then you always hear something happening in this sheet. And I added two concepts, ghost kitchen concept is all under and then my whole restaurant, so I did mochi donut, which is a gluten-free donut concept, fried to order a warm donut. It's doing so well that I'm looking for a location to open a real donut shop right now. Mm. And then also I started wholesale my frozen dumplings uh, to my friends in the restaurant industry, to different festivals, and obviously doing retail frozen dumplings for my uh, local customer for them grab and go as well. And then what else did I do? I added a fried chicken concept pop-up onto Mishi as well. Same thing, because I do a gluten-free fried chicken. So you can pretty much imagine during the, the past two and a half years that whatever I can for Mishi, I done it. And then I also started to host digital cooking demos <laughs> through Go wow. Belly. Mm -hmm. Through Go Bellies. And then also uh, I took on corporate clients. 
So I, I have Dell Computer, Salesforce. Hey, I did came from uh, Silicon Valley. Remember that? Sure. So now all my friends are still in the Silicon Valley. A lot of them are purchasing or high positions. So during COVID, during the time that, especially lockdown time, even now, so because there's a lot of corporate um, business cancel, you cannot do team building anymore. You cannot go out to play golf and then to do all those field trips anymore. So what do we do? We do cooking demos together for the corporate. So not only I do digital cooking demo, as you can see, this is my studio, but we also do their demo boxes. Uh, because we be able to ship Go Valley. So every single my cooking demo, we ship out a box to you so you can do cook along. And then, so that's another revenue that I added on this sheet. So my miss sheet is very small. It's only 3,000 square feet, but it has many hats to wear. There's a lot of concept coming out from my little store. And there's a lot of different revenue, different way of business that I do out of this. There's B2C, <laughs> B2B, or you name it. Uh, and then I, I wanted to say this has all happened because I, we were all forced to pivot. So we're all sitting here thinking about every single way that we can add revenue to our location. And, uh, and then we did it. So now we're looking for multiple locations and there's a lot of ghost kitchen concept wants to work with us. So I'm thinking about other way, a, another different level of business now, because I feel like there's a lot of B2B opportunity right now. So yeah, we're excited to looking forward to. What's the future for us? I'm not sure when you found time to sleep in the last two and a half years, based on what you just talked about. <laughs> uh, I, I also started off <laughs> a television career. I actually done well for the past three months, uh, three years as well, as you can see. Uh, but I have an amazing husband, beautiful, really great support group. Uh, and I also, my team is my heart. That's Can I fantastic. do it without them? Well, let's, let's talk about television for just a minute as well. So tell us about your experience on Top Chef. You were on season 14, and you were able to really kind of showcase Chinese-American cuisine. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? So I was on Top Chef twice. The first time was season 10, and the second time was season 14. It was on season 14 that I realized that this is what I do to build my brand properly. So even though I can cook all cuisines, you name it, I was classically trained French and really cook Italian for five years. But who I am is my, I am Chinese American. And this is why I decided that on Top Chef is a perfect, at least the second time around, is a perfect time around for me to showcase the modern Chinese American cuisines, which I feel like many of us try to stay away for the longest time. But then I'm very excited to see the past few years. Uh, since I've been on Top Chef, even before I've been on Top Chef season 14, but many of younger Chinese American chefs are actually coming out willing to pick up our sort of grandparents or our parents left off because for a while, for those that like my parents are not in the restaurant industry, I'm the first generation ever to be in this restaurant industry. But I know many of my friends, they came from the restaurant industry and then their parents really don't want them to go back. Yeah. Uh, so you definitely see that a lot of us now willingly wanted to know and learn more about our heritage and then to cook the food that's true to us and we are chinese american we don't cook any regional chinese cuisine because we didn't grow up or train any of those regions we grew up in america but we are chinese so we wanted to represent our own culture which is utilizing americans resources and then still using our flavor but not afraid to using other technique to really to create something really special to us, Chinese Americans. Well, that's great. That fusion is obviously a, a big part of it. And you're going to be on the main stage at the Northwest Food Show. You're going to be there on Sunday, the 26th of June up in Portland. What can our attendees look forward to learning from you at the show when you're up there on the main stage? So one thing that I love to uh, teach everybody is, first of all, why it comes to uh, I would like to showcase my modern Chinese American cuisine uh, is what I believe in. You don't have to have Chinese equipment hmm. in order to cook Chinese food. And that's where my cookbook comes from too. Like my first chapter is literally called to walk or not to walk. The reason is I want, I really want to teach people by using controlled heat. So instead of perhaps use a grill, perhaps use a cast iron to sear, 
you don't have to use a wok. Wok is high temperature steering. There's a lot of different, there's a, a it's, it's one pot that you can use in a lot of different ways, but I think it's very intimidating when it comes to a reg re uh, regular home cook. Not only regular home cook, it's very intimidating for a pro professional cook or chef that's not trained in Chinese cuisine. So I want to take that fear away from everybody. I want to teach everybody just use what you have in your regular Western kitchen, a cast iron pan, a saute pan, even a nonstick, a grill pan or a charcoal grill or some sort of, even a pizza oven. It's all about heat control. And with the correct seasoning and flavor, and you can produce really authentic Chinese American dishes anywhere. And I'm sure more people will be willing to embrace that if it's something that they're familiar with, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, you know, if you're used to using a cast iron pan or something like that, and you're familiar with it, you're probably more likely to try some new recipes. So that's exciting. Uh, 100%. 100%. Also, use oven. I, like, I love to use oven. And even though traditionally Chinese cuisine doesn't really, other than the down south roasting duck and barbecue, but that in a regular home cook, you don't really see the oven, but I love to use ovens. So there's many tricks that we can cheat with heat control that you can produce really authentic, delicious Chinese food uh, at home. So that's really my goal. That's great. We'll look forward to that. So one of the other reasons, obviously, other than coming to see you at the uh, Northwest Food Show is people want to see kind of what's the latest industry trends or what are some of the changes that are coming. What do you see uh, for restaurants in 2022? What are some of the things that you're looking forward to or that you're hearing about that people should be on the lookout for? So one thing that I feel like is came out from pandemic is the trend of every single restaurant making our own seasoning mix, makes our work own, like we make our own chili crisp and also like bacon jam and dumpling sauce and all, all things like that all became part of our self, like, like part of our identity. So I'm really seeing that each chef and also a lot of restaurants coming out with our own seasoning, um, like salt mix, chili crisp, or like different sauces, for example, like black pepper sauce that you can just take home. And then so you'd be able to use the sauce and seasoning to mix that from the from your favorite restaurant and then to recreate something at home. Uh, so I definitely see that this is a trend that I see will continue as only more and more of us is going to do. Uh, and, and then also, I think a way is very unfortunately, but automation is probably like working from a central kitchen and distribute out is because really that now you're looking at our industry, what we're struggling is labor. It doesn't matter how much we pay we raise our wages right now that we just don't have enough people to do that anymore. So therefore that you see many restaurant combined forces. Uh, so to sort of create this smaller, it just naturally, like we all work in this hummus kitchen together to create something together and we'll be able to distribute to all to our own individual restaurants. So I see this very possibly is going to become a trend. Yeah. We're hearing that a lot as well, the, the automation, the technology being a, a big part of it. It's interesting to me that you mentioned the, the spices and the mixes coming from restaurants because a lot of people did a lot of home cooking during the pandemic, during the, the lockdowns, and really wanted to try to replicate you know, restaurants' favorite dishes that they had, which is how you started in the restaurant industry, obviously. Is exactly. Going to those places and replicating and now making it even easier for home cooks to be able to do the same thing. So uh, I think that's fantastic. Um, well, what, what tips do you have for any industry members that might be looking for inspiration? You know, it can be difficult after the last couple of years to, to really try to have some hope and optimism about the future. But when you're looking for inspiration, what would you tell other cooks to do? What would you tell our industry to look for? I think for our industry to look for is don't get stuck in a box. So now a restaurant is not just about a restaurant in the box anymore. As a chef, as a culinary profession, we have a lot of different ways that we can do our different career op our career op options opportunity to do. And then also, even as an individual restaurant as well. So I really want you guys to don't only look at you as this little box, always to talk to everybody in your world, just to see if there's other opportunities that's food connected. Because remember, food is a connector. There's so many different ways to do culinary inspired, you know, to do culinary related uh, jobs. 
and career and different things. So through pandemic, I see many of my friends, they became, they came out with their own product line. They come out with their own sauces and selling sauces. Uh, they lost their job, but then had a very permanent top up. So actually be able to pursue dreams. And then also the fact that the ghost kitchen, all this concept, they're not going away. They're actually for here to stay. So many of this become chefs and line cooks. And then, you know, like, because it's a lot easier, cheaper to start a ghost, ghost kitchen concept. So like, keep your brain turning. Don't feel beat down. Like food is alive. And it, it connects to all parts of the world. You just never, you never know. Like, for example, like, like even quality control. Like I have one of a friend that trying to figure out like the new way of gum. Like she's becoming a food scientist to figure out this gum to be biodegradable. You know what I mean? Like, so you don't have to spit out plastic. So yeah. things like that all exist. And just don't feel like you have to tie in this box. I mean, obviously, Russia's always shorthanded, so we love that people still love to cook. Come back, don't leave us. And then we're only going to grow this more and more, uh, grow this better. But for those of you that feel like you get sick of this little Russian box, but don't get sick of food. Do not leave because it's so exciting. There's only more things to do. There's like 3D printers now. You just uh, imagine there's so much more fun things. And then it's like high tech innovation and food coming together is also such a big thing too. So, you know, like I release AFT and I also know that my friends do a dietary app on the metaverse on the web three, you know, like just for example, like don't feel like you have to be in this universe. You as a chef, we can work multi universe. And then there's also different ways of innovation because food is like, it's like a miracle. Like, it connects everything. So I really want everybody to just open your mind. Don't ever give up. It's just so much fun. I think that's great advice. Well, Chef, before I let you go, um, you mentioned working with Thomas Keller and some of the other celebrity chefs that you've worked with. What's just one important lesson maybe that you've learned working with some of those chefs and restaurant groups over the past couple of decades? Hmm. Learning from my chefs i think people uh you really have to know like restaurant business is, yes it's about food but most importantly we work with people uh, so your team is the most important people in your life uh, to grow a restaurant i feel like everybody's oh my god you have to have amazing dish you have to do this Yes, you need to have amazing environment. You have to have ma amazing food, but everything are produced by people. And then you need to have people's heart needs to be with you and you can feel the food. If people doesn't want to work, work for you anymore, you can feel the food doesn't just like, you can just feel it. There's no love. There's no passion in, in the food. So treat your people well, take care of your people. That's the most important thing. I think that's very well said, Chef. Will, will you be bringing any uh, cookbooks with you to the Northwest Food Show? Anything that folks can take home with them as a part of their experience with you? Yes, 100%. I can definitely bring some cookbooks. I would love to get one of those autographed by you as well. Sounds good, for sure. All right. Chef, is there anything that we have not talked about yet that you'd like to touch on? Uh, I think we are good. But if, I hey, oh, I know. Yeah. Can I do a little commercial? Is it okay? Sure. Okay. Because for me, it's really easy. If you're curious and you really want to taste my Chinese American cuisines, you can always order. Like I said, I have a little shop on Gold Valley, eight items. So different dumplings, handmade scallop pancake, and tea smoked duck, and gluten-free orange chicken. So all those special treats that you can easily get. I sh we ship nationwide. I love it. I look forward to ordering some of that myself before you show up. On Sunday, <laughs> June 26th you. at the main stage at the Northwest Food Show. Thank you very much, Chef Shirley Chung. Look forward to meeting you in person. Thank you for having me. Bye. All right. Welcome to Boil Down, the podcast for the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association. I'm Greg Astley, your host, Director of Government Affairs for the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association. And with me today is Chef Tregay. Welcome, Chef. Hey, hey. Thank you for having me. Super excited to have you on this version of our podcast, as well as, of course, at the no Northwest Food Show. 
Um, I want to get into the food show in a few minutes, but before we start there, I have to ask, so how would you describe your journey to becoming a chef? Wow. Okay, Greg. I don't know. You may have to cut this down a little bit because it's so, um, you know what? I think my journey is a beautiful journey and I love to talk about it because I think it's very, I mean, it inspires me even when I talk about it, but I think, you know, for me, I started off very young as a chef, um, right out of high school. I started cooking when I was 17 years old. Um, I originally wanted to be a brain surgeon and I found out how long you had to go to school and then it was a no for me i was like well never mind um and then you know it was i was so inspired i started i got my first job when i was younger and i started uh cooking in a, a hotels and then i decided to go to culinary school and i graduated culinary school but for me uh you know i'm thinking i'm hot stuff i just graduated everybody's gonna hire me well nobody wanted to hire me <laughs> they said that i was too brand new and too fresh so, you know, I've always been the type of person to take my address into my own hands. So I went and I found the top restaurant group in Atlanta, which at the time was fifth group in Buckhead Life Restaurants and a uh, group. And I told them, listen, I work for you for free. All I want is it to be on my resume because I really wanted to work at this Marriott for some reason because it was just a big glass building. I don't know why I just wanted to work there. So I worked for them for free and um, I ended up getting that job that I wanted. From there, I kind of worked different corporate jobs. And then I just realized, I'm just not that corporate. So I decided um, I had to take matters into my own hands. I started catering on the side and I literally would work 60 hour days at the hotel. And then I would go and do catering afterwards. And then one day I just woke up and said, I'm just ready to step out. So I went on Instagram actually, found a few people, chefs here locally. We met up, we hung out. And those people came back and was like, hey, you want to do the great food truck race? So I'm like, yeah, at this point I've had so much experience and fine dining was where my journey really began. Um, and so from there, I said, yeah. So we went and we did the great food truck race. Um, we tried out for it. We didn't make it because they said we were all too good <laughs> and it would make for a boring show. So I'm like, okay, you know, no problem. Um, and, but I ended up getting a call back from Cutthroat Kitchen and I went out, won that first episode, did God's Grocery Games, won that my chef finally was like, listen, Trigue, I, I got to put two hats on. I, my chef hat says I can't keep giving you all these days off. <laughs> my friend hat says that, you know, I think you can do this. And it really motivated and inspired, inspired me simply because this is the same chef that I worked for for five years. And I felt like he hated me. He used to tell, I found out he was telling people like, I would never, right. you know, you represent Trigue because she's loud, ghetto and uncouth. I'll never forget it. And so I made it my business to prove him wrong. And that's why I tell people all the time, people who you think are the gatekeepers, you are the gatekeeper. You have the, pro the power to change anyone's mind. Because from there, he was just raving about me because he couldn't believe that I was going on these shows on Food Network and I was just winning back to back. So from there, um, I entered into my Food Network star journey. Uh, and the way I did that was I remember I was sitting on my couch and I was watching Food Network star season 11. And I remember saying, wow, you know, like, why didn't they hire me, uh, bring me on? I didn't get a phone call for season 12, you know, I mean, season 11. And I was like, that's okay, because I'm going to be on next time. And I'm not going to call. They're just going to call me. Two weeks later, Beat Bobby Flay, Cutthroat Kitchen called me to come back for a re-challenge and Food Network star. So, of course, I chose Food Network star because I get a job. Right. Um, and then I got on there. Now this is a different space in my journey because it was like, oh my God, you know, I got a little nervous um, because, you know, there are not a lot of people like me on Food Network. I'm the first African-American woman to ever win Food Network star. Um, you know, I come from an urban area. I didn't, they don't talk like me. They don't look like me. So I was very nervous. And I remember that first episode of Food Network star. Well, I, even before I get there, I remember thinking all these things. And I remember the producer saying, hey, well, send me, you know, that outfit, whatever outfits you want, we're going to give you your outfits. But at the same time, you know, you can bring your own stuff, but we have to see it. And I remember at that time I was dead broke. I didn't have any money. And I was in a store and I saw this dress. It was $500. And I remember saying, I got to get this dress because this is the dress I'm going to wear when I win. So light bill doing everything. I bought the dress. <laughs> so, <laughs> I bought the dress and I turned it in and I was like look put this in here because this is the dress I'm going to wear when I win she laughed she thought it was so funny but that is the dress that I wore when I won 
And for me, it was a challenge at first because I wasn't sure if I should be myself. I come on and Giada and Bobby are judging us for the first episode. And I remember I was like, hey, you know, I'm Chef Tregay. We're going to keep it cute and blah, 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 blah. You know, I was just real sassy and having fun. And I remember Giada saying, mm, you know, you're you're good, but you remind me of kind of like, I don't know, I can't describe it like a caricature. I remember she said that. And I felt like, wow, you know, I didn't think that that was, I didn't know if that was a compliment or if it was a bad thing. So I decided to change it. And when we got on this, we, the big screen, the first episode, it was in a movie theater full of people. And I just knew I felt horrible because I just knew I wasn't myself. And I remember as I watched if this on this big screen in this room full of people, I just started crying mm. because I remember just thinking, you know, I inspire girls and I always tell them like, be yourself. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. don't let anybody change you. And I literally was watching myself be someone else. And I said, I promise that would never happen. And at the judges table, uh, Giada told Tyler Florence, he was one of the judges. And she was like, you know, I don't know who that was up there. You know, Trigay normally has a lot of spunk and I don't know what happened. She was like, Trigay, what happened? And I was like, well, I didn't know what that meant when you said what you said. And, you know, I'm taking this serious. And she was like, well, you just showed me that you can't even pretend to be someone else. So just be yourself. And that gave me fire and it gave me the green light. And I was winning competitions back to back and I just took the crown home. That's um great. and from there I just keep going. Now I got a book. I got my I have two cooking shows and you know it's pretty awesome. Yeah I told you the journey is it's it's deep and it's long but for me I just really love that story. I and, and that story is in my book Kitchen Conversations with Chef Trigay. Um you, you know that book is a I tell everybody it's like my memoir and it just so happens to have a lot of great recipes. And I tell that story because I just, it, it's so important to me for people to understand, like you can control your journey. Like all you have to do is believe in yourself. It, yeah. it, it's so cliche. It sounds so cliche, but it's so true. I've witnessed it. I've manifested my life. I, I say what I'm going to do and I get it done. You can do it. Just put your mind to it. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to look forward to getting a signed copy of that book when you come to the show then. Of course, I'll have one special for you, Greg. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me let me go back a little bit. I, I know a lot of chefs take their inspiration from somebody when they were younger, whether it's, you know, a grandmother or your father, or one of your parents. Who inspired you to become a chef? What, what was it that, that you decided that's what you wanted to do? Was there somebody early on in your life? Yeah, it was actually my grandmother. Um, my style of cooking is uh, food fusion. And what that is, is I cook food from all over the world, 27 different countries, and I fuse my Southern flair with it. And I really got that from my grandmother. That story is in the book too, because I, I just remember as a kid, I would walk into the house, I would drop my book bag, I would close my eyes, and then I would just smell the smells. And I would try to imagine or guess what she cooked for dinner. We never had leftovers and she always did something different. I remember when she used to test stuff out, like her first time trying this jerk seasoning. We had jerk everything for like three weeks, jerk meatloaf, jerk chicken, jerk everything. But it was inspiring because it was like she thought outside the box. And I just said, I want to be like that. I want to cook like that. I want my family to feel like that. I want people to see food differently like she helped me to see food differently. So that is where all of my cooking inspiration came from. Wow, that's fantastic. What a great story. What can we expect from you at the Northwest Food Show? What, what kinds of things are you going to be doing for us up on the main stage? You know, there's, I, I'm struggling with the recipes right now. I, it, you know, because I have so many fun things that I want to do. And so it's either between this, I do like this deep fried ravioli that I want to do. Um, it's like, it has crab in it, it has Alfredo and pesto. Um, or do I want to do something like fresh? Because I have like a, um, a hot honey and I do like a salad with it or um, hot honey shrimp. It's, it's so good. So uh, what are the two? I'm going to surprise okay. you. You just have to oh. come and see. Well, you're not going to surprise me because I know what they are, but either way, they sound delicious. I'm already salivating. <laughs> so I'm going to have to <laughs> bring extra napkins to the show now, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, Chef, you have a nonprofit playing the game tour. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you hope it can accomplish? Absolutely. Oh, gosh, I came up with that. Again, everything that I do, I come up with because of, of my struggles and things that I've been through, I, you know, confusion as a kid and, you know, not really having a place. And so I developed this um, 
nonprofit because it originally started with other chefs. And so what I did was I had a chef who was like a little rough. I had a chef that was a little nerdy. I had a chef, all these different personalities. And we would go to schools and each chef would connect with the kids. Each chef that had spoken would connect and then we would do a cafeteria takeover and we would flip the cafeteria and I remember the first one we did um steak and lobster we flipped their cafeteria and made it fine dining and they came in for lunch and it was a fine dining lunch a lot of those kids had never even had lobster never seen lobster in person and it was beautiful um obviously COVID came in and that kind of slowed things down um but in between I have a summer camp that I do and that's kind of that we had this is the first year that we didn't do it well between this year and last year because of COVID um but I think we're going to start back next year and I do that with Ron Clark Academy which is a school founded by um funded by Oprah Winfrey and um those kids are so bright and uh, in a three-week span I teach them how to create a recipe we go to the grocery store um, and I teach them how to shop for that recipe, um, food costs and things like that. And then at the end, um, I teach classes for Piedmont um, Hospital here for the Cancer Wellness Center and their cancer patients. But this time during summer camp, the goal is for them to create a three course meal and I break them up into groups and they teach the cancer patients oh, the wow. recipes that are cancer friendly. And it's so I cry every year. I just. You know, be, it's I can so only beautiful imagine, yeah. because, uh, you know, like one of my girls, she has diabetes. And I remember um, there was a, a lady with leukemia that was there. And when I remember walking in and she looked so sad. And by the end of the class, she came and she hugged me and she cried. And, and I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> She's like, I never thought that I could eat good food again. And when I ate that food that you guys created, I never thought of these fun recipes that were health conscious and they, I still feel good after eating them. And you just really helped me and changed a lot of my life today. And that really was the goal. And it makes the girl so happy, you know, oh, to yeah. be able to know that they've created something and they've changed someone's life. So we do that every year. And that, that's the, the, the point of playing the game, and teaching them how to play the game of life. That's fantastic. Wow. What a great story. Well, I was going to ask you if you if you had a specific story from that, but you already told me one. And, and what a great story that is. I mean, yeah. to be able to give somebody that opportunity, uh, like you said, to to eat food again that they didn't think they'd be able to and, and to enjoy yeah. it, uh, which is really obviously what we do in our industry is, you know, we live to serve. Right. We want to yeah. welcome people into our homes through our food and, and, and what we can do. Um, yeah. Well, as we come out of uh, COVID, because we are still coming out of COVID, I believe, um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in, in the food industry that kind of excite you? Um, what, what are some things that you see on the horizon that uh, really are inspiring to you? A couple of things. I still love that ghost kitchens are really still doing it big right now. Like you can go in, you don't have to talk to anybody, you put your order in, it's ready, it's beautiful food. It's not just like some stuff you throw away. I mean, I was at a uh, the mall the other day and there was a ghost kitchen in there and they had the best vegan stuff ever and that's the other thing I love is the vegan trend it's going crazy I love how you know uh it, it's vegan it's from the table it tastes amazing it's easy on the gut um so I love that I think and thirdly I love the shorter menus because you remember back in the days like you would go into the restaurant and it's like a hundred things on the menu. Right. You're taking 30 minutes to order. Your bill is a thousand dollars because you couldn't pick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, so now they've kind of shortened that, which is great for the restaurant and great for the consumer. So I think those are my three favorite trends. Right. Now. That's terrific. So what tips do you have for other industry members that maybe are looking for inspiration? What kind of things would you like to pass along to some of your peers? Um, I think, you know, just stay on top of the trends, stay connected to the culture. You know, um, I know a lot of people on our social media, but I love to be there because I see what everyone loves and everyone wants. Um, I get inspired and I get great ideas and I can take those ideas and flip them into something else. I think just constantly being current is important um, to people because people want to feel like they're in the now and they want to enjoy good food. Right. And then also, you know, just for themselves. You know, even like with the shorter menus, that's going to save you as a restaurant, less waste. You know, people are kind of staying at home a little bit. So that'll help out, too. So just stay on top of those trends. That's important for any restaurant, I think. People come to events like the 2022 Northwest Food Show specifically to find things like the trends, what's hot right now. And you mentioned ghost kitchens, but 
Um, what else is getting you really excited and you think people should be kind of looking for or, or starting to pay more attention to when it comes to trends in our industry? Um, I think just making things more sustainable, you know, even with your packaging. I love the new packaging that people have now. I love the cute little, um, I mean, it, these things seem simple, but leaving the little forks that they have in the, the metal straws and things like that, you know, to save the planet. Um, all of those things are important because, man, our planet is going through it right now. So I think that's super important. And to know that you don't have to just get a brown box, you can get a really cute one. They have so many different trends and so many ways to do it. Um, so again, staying with that trend as well is, is just important to me as a food. Terrific. Well, for all of the potential attendees, for all of the listeners out there, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like them to know either about yourself, what you're going to be doing at the show, or just generally what you want to talk about? Um, I would just say in general, hey, make sure y'all get that book because I, you know, Kitchen Conversations with Chef Trigay is amazing. It's available on Amazon. You can grab it. Make sure you're tuning in to Trigay's Way and Cake Alike. They are both streaming on Discovery Plus right now. Uh, Trigay's Way is my show. It's amazing. It started off on Oprah Winfrey Network. It was actually one of the first food shows on Oprah Winfrey Network. Um, and it's, it's literally just me, my friends, and my kids, and my family. And we're having a good time and cooking good food. Um, so I think they would love that show. And, you know, just be ready for a good time. I think we're going to have fun. I love to have fun. And i tell you one thing. You send Chef Trigay to do a show, you're going to get a show. Gonna be awesome. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Chef Trigay. And if you bring the kind of energy that you brought to this podcast today, I have no doubt in my mind that people are going to be inspired by your appearance at the Northwest Food Show. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to being there. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you.